Hello, and welcome to Best Story Wins, a column five podcast where we have in-depth conversations with some of the best and brightest from the world of brand building and content marketing. I'm your host, Josh Ritchie, and I'm here with a special co-host for today, Travis Keith. Today, our guest is Michelle Kim, the VP of Brand at VideoAmp. Hey, Michelle. Thanks for joining us today. How are you doing? Hey, guys. Thanks so much for having me. I'm doing great. Uh, Yeah. Awesome. So, Michelle, you're the VP of Brand at VideoAmp. What does that mean? What do you do? And uh, what's interesting about your company? You know, honestly, what it means is I have the best job. I have a really fun job. Um, In all seriousness, it just really means I get to work with an awesome creative team. And we really do execute upon like everything that video does in the visual way. So whether it's in person through our events or visually through something like our website or something like our collateral, we really do communicate that out to the world. Um, Also, what I do, sorry, in a nutshell... I don't know how to describe this question. People always ask, like, what do you do? My parents still don't know what I really do. But I would say in a nutshell, it's just a combination of like, you know, crafting that video story from a public facing side of things, um, all the way, you know, from video content to client experiences, all the way to keeping our internal folks feeling on brand. So like they feel best set up to understand what we do, how we do it, why we do it. Um, and that involves a lot of different teams, right? So when you say, what do I do? I kind of facilitate a lot of the times, but sometimes I'm also designing. Um, sometimes I'm doing podcasts. So that's why I say I really do have the best job because like, it's not just like a one line answer. It's really hard for me to understand. I'm a creative, um, but I'm not just pigeonholed into that. I really do enjoy a lot of the mentorship and teaching size of this company that, that allows me to do this. Um, and something that's really interesting about this company, what drew me to it and why I'm still here is... I really think it has an it factor, uh, whatever that means to you. But for me, it's just so palpable. The ambition that I feel here is something that I've never felt anywhere else. Um, and it's something that you can't really train anybody to have. We can't even pay people to have. It's just something that's like very uncommon. And for me, like, you know, problems and things that we're trying to solve aside, the culture here, the fun side of things paired with the ambition is like, that's the most interesting thing for me. And for a creative, it's like the gold nugget. That's awesome. Yeah. The, the infectious energy that you, you speak of, it's something that, um, you know, people that interact with your team, obviously, um, for you and for TK and myself, we've worked together before and we've been working together for quite some time. And that's something that, that, you know, they relate to to the broader team that they just so enjoy working with you guys. Um, for the people at home. Yeah. Yeah. For the people at home that maybe (laughs) aren't super familiar with video amp, um, how would you describe the company and, um, what it does, what its main product or value is. Yeah. So I think, you know, if I tie it back to trying to explain similar to like what I do, it's really hard to say just what a company does in the simplest format. But I say the clearest way to describe VM is through its mission statement, right? I mean, why it even exists is like we're really trying to create a better and more holistic way um, of workflow for the entire advertising ecosystem. And what that really means is that, you know, VDM's mission is to increase value um, through advertising by redefining the way that media is actually value bought and sold. That just is a daunting statement and a daunting task. But you know what? We're here for it. I think that's another thing. Like VDM is here for it. We're like the risk takers and we are the game changers. Um, We get to work with some of the biggest brands and publishers and really help them with their media spend, how to optimize their workflow and just make smarter decisions, right? So like the way that the media landscape is today is so different uh, from just like 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago. And our industry is so old. It's like 100 years old. People are very set in their ways and there's some archaic systems. But just I can imagine just you, how you ingest media is not how our parents did or, you know, even like 20 years ago, sitting on a TV watching set top box, waiting for the next advertising. It's very, very different. Talk about streaming services, the different devices that we have, um, all different channels, and just even like the length of content that's being pumped out. So Vineyard just harnesses all that, like the whole landscape of like what media and consumption really is. And we really just try to provide a better um, way for companies to spend their money and get a better return. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a great explanation. Um, So... Prior to Video Amp, um, what did you do? How did you how did you get to where you're at right now? And as sort of a follow up to that question, when did you first realize that building brands was what you wanted to focus on in your career? Yeah, you know how I got here. How did I get here? It <laughs> kind of like tripped me out because I, you know, did a little bit of internal uh, introspective work and just saying like, yeah, how did I get here? It was like 
super high, fast paced um, company in LA. Um, but honestly, my background has always been in the creative field. I, from very early on, I would say in high school was when I really honed in on like really being a visual person. Um, but the other part of me equally was like, I really was interested in human behavior. So, um, I think that's a perfect combination with how I got to ad tech was you are really focusing on everyone's real life behavior and, um, patterns and habits that people, you know, exhibit. And then there's a whole side of it is like creatively communicating that and addressing issues. So with VideoAmp, there is a platform, right? So we have a piece of software that addresses all the nitty gritty, but then the messaging that goes out to tell that story um, is something that I learned through working at, previously at a data geolocation data company. Um, and even before that, I worked in e-commerce. Um, so I was kind of like always in that digital um, space in the past decade. But previous to that, my journey was kind of like, I kind of just tossed my net really, really wide. I came from working on music graphics and I went to an advertising agency, so a creative agency, all the way to print publishing and then had a brief stint in fashion. So I kind of dabbled in a lot of things, but the commonality was uh, solving problems for the people and just something that was a little bit more, you wouldn't have a bored day, a bored day at work. I was didn't want to just kind of coast through or um, know, that, know what I was going to get into. I think that was a very common thread for every job that I've had. And I think with advertising technology, it was kind of the pinnacle of like, I mean, TK knows this, like not one day is the same. And I mean that like in all honesty, I don't know what I'm going to walk into every day in the best way. So there's a personality um, alignment that happened there. Um, But at the end of the day, it's, I still want to be the creative um, brain behind it. So still using things that maybe an engineer might see and interjecting some of that um, value and then kind of uh, combining that to release value. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, Yeah, I, I, that's a really interesting career path. And it, it kind of reminds me of what so many people say when you ask them a similar question. It's like, I kind of fell into it by exploring my curiosity and various interests. And, you know, over time, they all kind of intersected. So that's really cool to hear that. Um, you, you touched on kind of the fast moving nature of a startup. And as many of us know, mm-hmm. working at a startup can mean that things are constantly changing all the time. What would you mm-hmm. say uh, really changed dramatically or really quickly over the last couple of years with COVID and, you know, coming out of, coming out of that. And now we're in this kind of interesting market, market environment. I mean, COVID was so wild, but, and I know a lot of people have like very negative feelings about it, but I've really, really tried to focus on the positive that came out of it. Um, Some really awesome things came out of COVID. Honestly, I saw a lot of personal growth from just even my inner circle and people that I work with, it's like people became very self-sufficient, you know? Uh, Maybe we were just so reliant on one another in the best way, but when we're really, everyone was kind of forced into a corner to have a timeout, we became very resilient. Um, Everyone tapped into skills that maybe they didn't know they had or adopted new skills. Um, And I think that's like one of the most unique things that has happened to us in the past, you know, I don't know when this will happen again, um, and it really did enable us to like dig dig a little deeper. We didn't just like go to work nine to five Monday through Friday, live for the weekend, go back. Everyone had to find a new way to like not just get through the day, but keep themselves motivated, keep themselves healthy, um, but also stay positive, stay afloat. A lot of us were displaced from our families. Um, a lot of people went through tragedies, but like you know, I think you know, I did see a lot of positive growth. And so I think that permeated into the workforce and the way that we treat each other, so much more compassion for one another, being a little bit more empathetic to circumstances. Um, you know, the, the habits that we adopted during COVID didn't just magically go away when, you know, quote unquote, the world opened up. Some people really adopted things that they didn't want to let go of. And we became a little bit more flexible into understanding that. And it might not have been a, like a normal um you know, circumstance for like the nine to five work, work day. And we kind of had to just adjust and really just all become chameleons and understand like adaptability was super, super key into someone's success. And, um, I think you can't do that alone. So there was a sense of togetherness, even though we were alone that I don't think we could have really gotten without having gone through something like that. Yeah. We're, we also still live for the weekend though, too. Okay. Truth, but (laughs) (laughs) is it the weekend already? (laughs) Exactly. Um, well, as it relates to, you know, obviously the title of this podcast is best story wins and we're, mm-hmm. we're big on like storytelling, but that term has kind of been, uh, either oversimplified or a lot of people have kind of a different take on what the term storytelling means. So 
how would you, like in the work that you do, how would you kind of define storytelling, like what it is and what it isn't? Honestly, I have definitely asked this question to people that are not in my field because I was just curious. What do people actually think? Because as also a creative, I think it's super important to remove yourself. You get so mm -hmm. tunnel vision. You get so used to your peers, people that understand you, but you cannot tell a good story unless you get outside perspective. Um, storytelling is absolutely not a mantra or a one-line statement or a be-all, end-all. You got to really treat it like a living thing, like almost like a plant. You've got to nurture it. You know, at certain seasons, it becomes dormant and then it comes up and it blooms during spring. Um, it doesn't do well in sunny conditions. It, you know, there's all these facets that come into um, a brand storytelling moment journey. Um, so it's a sensitivity to what's going on again in the world. So brand is for your people, the people out there. It's not for you. It's definitely never for you. It's never just come only directly from your heart. You should be servicing something or someone for the better, right? And then the only way you get that actual feedback is actually asking directly to your audience. Um, sometimes not even your target audience, just like random, just to be like, hey, like, does this even like resonate with you? Would you even look at it? Um, do you understand it? Are we saying messaging in a way that's digestible and not alienating? All these different tactics really bleed into how a company can actually be really effective. Um, you take a stance as a company, say like, hey, this is why I exist. But you can't just say, hey, we exist here. Please accept us. Um, your storytelling is like, hey, this is why we're here. How can we help you? And how can we expand that um, demand and service you the best? So I think it's a lot of things in terms of multisensory. It's also not just solely visual. It's just not just audio. And recently with um, something that I've noticed is people are just really focused on immersive design mm. um, and immersive marketing. So it's not, again, we just like all we're relying on maybe video and um, visual and audio for a minute there with COVID, we were kind of limited, but now that we're kind of all a little bit feeling a little bit safer, immersive design. I mean, just think about AR, VR technology, think about the spatial design, lights, music, all the different things that are really tapping into emotion. Um, that's what really makes a story succeed. If you can walk away understanding why someone exists or a company exists and like what their brand positioning is, but that lingering feeling I think that is your golden ticket to being a successful brand. That's really cool. My uh, my brother was a film student and they had an exercise in his class where they would show like a very famous uh, clip, but the music was stripped out and they would mm -hmm. then swap it out with different types of music. And then the final like score of what it actually ended up being. And it was so crazy. I sat in with him watching just like what the music did in terms of like how you were feeling as you were watching a specific scene and how it like mm -hmm. altered even how you related to characters and how you related mm -hmm. to the, the the script or the plot. So the immersive design thing is really, really cool. Oh, the one thing that I is always interested to me is you spend so much time uh, or you give adequate, if not equal, even maybe more time, like internally, like how the culture is being, you know, personified and um, mm -hmm. how people are feeling internally. But to face externally for a second, how would you explain like the brand story at your company and what it tends to like, how it resonates with buyers, let's say? Sure. So can I just use the term, the client? So like when we yeah. like service our sure. cli clients, um, yeah, honestly, we have such a complicated industry. So let's just not overcomplicate it. I think that's just kind of like the like messaging mm -hmm. we put out there in the world that really resonates is like, Look, I think some of these seasoned veterans in the industry, like, no, they're very aware of like the problems and sort of like these like decades long problems that have existed. Um, what video comes in is like, hey, we're also like not the newest kids on the block, but we have this energy, we have this hunger and we have this like really fiery spirit about us where we're willing to take the risks versus sit back and kind of like wait to see what other people are doing. No, we're just like gung ho moving forward. Like we're going to try it. Internally, it starts with saying like, hey, video app employees, don't be afraid to break it, break it mm. quickest, like quicker, learn faster, and then put it out there, like iterate as fast as you can, because the longer you linger on an idea and you wait for everything to perfectly line up, you're just going to like lose time and time and time. And the way that our industry moves, I'm telling you, it moves like so quickly that if you wait too long, you're going to miss the bus. Sure. And, you know, we want to be the ones driving that bus, picking people up, coming for the ride and with our clients. They just love that kind of like even like edgy, fun personality. I think that's what they buy into because end of the day, you don't want to hire somebody to kind of just like get you to the finish line. You kind of want to have somebody that's like going to go through the mud with you. They're going to go through the mud. 
they're willing to fail on their face as well, you know, and like really just like be honest about it. Um, there's no smoke and mirrors here. It's just literally like, I know some of our people that are really just like working with the clients day in and day out. They have such a close bond. You know, they will pick up the phone mm-hmm. at any hour of the day um, just because we know how important these problems are. And like, sometimes they're up against it. We're up against it because they're up against it and they know that we're with them. So when they're there, we're right there next to them. And I think that friendship team mentality is different than your traditional kind of client for hire relationship. Um, and I hope, you know, I, I really think that permeates wide into our industry and like what really keeps them coming back to us. Yeah, I, I love that. We've tried to implement some of that same language where, you know, we're trying to alter like the vendor status and be more like, hey, do we're a partner. We're really trying to help you solve your business problems and challenges. Um, and we want to be alongside the ride. Um, what is so interesting to me about VideoAmp is at face value, if you just say, hey, yeah, we're a B2B tech company. Like when someone tells me that, I'm like, okay, cool. They got a blue logo. They sound like this. They talk like this, you know, and you guys are the antithesis of what I would consider like (laughs) a corporate B2B tech, uh, you know, organization, which is a testament to the brand that you've built. What do you think, what do people misunderstand or get wrong when it comes to telling like a good brand story? Hmm. I think honestly, at the highest level, they're, they're expecting a story, just like they Mm -hmm. want to be sold a story and a dream and like just kind of get shelved and kind of like looked over maybe once a year. That's just really not us. I think that, like I said, we really double down even if it's, yeah, I, I would say we even double down internally as a company. Know your purpose. Know why you're here because it shows. If you're just showing up to work, clocking in and out, your work product shows. People like really pick up on that. Um, so that's another thing that I really think video does really well. It's like, yeah, it might just seem like repetitive or something, but I think it's really important to like start with the people inside because they are going to be the ones evangelizing, evangelizing your brand from all teams, right? Because like I, on a creative side, know it in one way. Engineering knows it one way. People team knows it one way. You know, everyone has a different sort of like stance and like expertise level here and they're hired for a certain reason. End of the day though, are we sharing that same goal? The goal is what drives your story as a company. So effectively how you talk, the language, the tone, the approach, um, and that directly, you know, when I'm giving messaging, like words on a piece of paper, how do I emulate that visually through video, through the website, through the app, through the events that we put on? All those little details need to tie into one connective tissue. Um, and that really can't be done unless people know why they're here. You can't just take take a job, call it a day. And I think video does a really good at vetting and setting people up for success here in that um, education cycle when you're first onboarded or even like people who have been here for a while just want a refresher. They need a renewed sense of purpose. They need to know that the people that have been hired since them are also sharing the same goal and vision. Um, and that needs to be something that is just second nature. Um, you know, when someone's nervous, you can kind of pick up a nervous laughter or cues. It's just the same. People don't really understand why they're here. It's really obvious. So um, brand story is not just something that's for leadership to execute upon. It's just everyone from day one, know why you're here. It is your duty to carry that vision out in your specific, you know, avenue of effort, expertise. Yeah, that's a great response. So one of the things that... Uh, Travis made me think of when he was talking about how you're not the orthodox, not the kind of cooker cutty cooker cookie cutter um, tech company. Is I thought of the the apparel that you guys have developed. The, it's it's essentially a full like streetwear like line. <laughs> so could you talk a little bit more about like where that idea came from and how that how that supports the brand and serves as sort of an extension of the brand story. Absolutely. Um, well, thanks so much. I mean, obviously TK reps it really, really hard and I appreciate that. Um, so the concept was, look, have you ever gotten a goodie bag from a super corporate company and it's a mouse pad and maybe a dad <laughs> cat like, with maybe a really, really cheap embroidered logo that's like five times too big? Mm. Yeah, we've all been there, right? I mean, nothing turns you off from like, hey, someone just went down the goodie bag line, threw something in and shipped it to me. That again is a motive. Like, regardless of what the actual object is, you had a feeling. You're like, is this all I'm really worth? So, we kind of want to flip that experience on his head. And, like, we invested on creating an actual e commerce store that's, you know, obviously free for an entire um, company to tap in once a quarter. And we release collections. And these collections, 
and the idea of the store were inspired by drops. I mean, honestly, when the sneaker new sneaker drops and there's like rumors and whispers and kind of like online uh, murmurs about like, hey, you know, you want to build that height. We kind of adopted that as like, hey, someone in design said like something's coming on the pipeline. They put a little Easter egg out. They said a really weird thing recently. Is that the new drop theme? Um, so we kind of like to tease things out and we create the store and we average from like maybe like five to six items, everything from apparel to home goods to most recently baby and um, pet swag. And that is, again, internal brand, right? So again, why are you here? Have fun. We're here in a really complicated world, industry solving really hard problems. Does not mean that you have to be suited and booted and like so, um, you know, in your world, like shake loose. And that's the best part of my job is like remind people that we're just people sitting next to you trying to achieve the same goal, but we're all equipped with different talents. And like maybe once in a while, like it's my duty to kind of shake things up. I love that the store, um, the products have garnered so much love and the freedom that we've had and like the, um, just the ability to kind of shake what employees gifting can look like. So, you know, the height when we open the store, it's like a timed release. It's a secret thing. Once someone knows about it, it just spreads like wildfire across Slack. And people are like, oh my God, it's open. Get your item. And we also do um, limited quantity. So again, going back to the concept, that's how drops are done in the real world. There's only X amount of quantity. Kind of want to have like a collector's um, edition vibe to it. And, you know, Kaleo, he's kind of been the driving force. He's our principal designer. And I'm so honored to work al- alongside him. He's been here since day one. Mm. So he's sort of been here um, twice the length that I've been here. So he kind of has seen the whole brand evolution of the company. And so he's kind of like the best person to really um, champion this, uh, the store and the swag and do these fun little, you know, moments of reward too. I think that's another thing that gets overlooked is you got to reward high performers. And this company is chock full of like innovators, uh, overachievers. And then when you just sprinkle in a dose of fun or like make you look twice, what are they doing? That little confusion, it just breaks up their day. And then lingering after effects is like, you see someone wearing the hoodie that you're too late to get, you know, you know, you easily lose. It's like that kind of like, competitive healthy competitive vibe in the company and then so like next time the job comes like they want to be first they kind of like sweet talk the design team they're trying to find their avenues in but kind of keep tight lipped about it (laughs) yeah that's so cool i mean hearing you and seeing you talk about this it's it's obvious that you're you're really enjoying this work and it's actually something that you're having fun doing which is so cool because i think that a lot of people give a lot of lip service to having fun at work or pushing the envelope or doing just crazy things that are kind of out of the, out of the norm mm-hmm. for a certain type of company, and you guys are actually doing that. I just want to say that's super cool. I'm I really appreciate it. I appreciate that so much. I I do have fun. I mean, I told you from the first question, I have the best job. Yeah, I have the most fun. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Okay, so what are other brands that you see doing it well, like you guys? And it obviously doesn't have to be in the same industry, but like, who else do you draw inspiration from, or like affinity brands that you're like, oh man, these guys. Th- these folks are doing it right. Yeah. You know, I personally try to always choose not to look at our industry peers. Sure. Um, I think I just need that. I need to remove myself so like in all areas, like, like physically and just mentally, when I look for inspiration, I need to go do something different. Um, uh, and then, you know, something that applies to like, at least that's a little bit related to the space is like, I actually look at a lot of ads, you know, obviously it's applicable to like, the, you know, the clients that we work with, but I also like, the time, like the video ads, I like the, just the medium. I'm just personally like in that world a lot. And I was just also trying to learn better. So if you couldn't tell, I like to have fun. So I was really impressed with two brands that really honed in on the fun aspect. Um, first one was Instacart. I think Instacart became a household name during COVID. So again, it was kind of blew up based on fear, it was like, oh my gosh, I'm too scared to go out because I don't know what's going to happen, but Instacart will solve this problem and bring stuff to me. So it was a very fear-driven sort of debut in like, at least in my mind, it was like, that was their bread and butter. It's like, we're going to help you by saving you. And it was very fear-driven. But now that we're all kind of grocery shopping for our own, they kind of flipped it us on the head. They were like very more friendly humor approach. Like, we know your time is so valuable. You want to just sit on your couch and do nothing? Let us bring it to you, you know? And just like stylistically, they don't use a ton of messaging. Their commercials right now are all just animations that are very bubbly and colorful. And they just use a throwback song. I mean, that just like hits home on so many levels for me personally. It's like, I watch it all the time. I don't just, you know, click through and like, they change it up. It's like, yeah, 
when you want to be with your girlfriends after a break, you just want a pint of ice cream just brought to your <laughs> doorstep. No one, no one wants to go out sobbing, you know? But then also when you have a date night, you're too frazzled. You saw in- ingredients brought to you so you feel equipped for your first date. I mean, they just hit home in like a very relatable way and it made you smile. So again, anything that can leave you, make you smile and like lingers with you, I think, you know, you hit a home run there. Um, another one was also the progressive commercials. I think in the past decade, we had Flo and she was very chipper and perky and like very friendly. But they really flipped it us on the head. They went back. They went back to like this nostalgia. Even the style of the video was a little bit more colored in a different way. And it's Dr. Rick now, you know, just like, please don't become your parents. Like, guys, like, we just got to like not do it all costs. Oh. Just, yeah, save us at all costs. Do not become, you know, that yeah. dad. That's just like, and I think, again, I chuckle. And they did a whole extensive series. It wasn't just a like one thing. Again, so they didn't good. just like one and done it. They've done series upon it to kind of like, resonate with different buckets of people um, across the country that really were like, yeah, like I've been there, had this exact same conversation. And then you think about it, you don't think an insurance company is going to like make you laugh, but it made you laugh. So mm-hmm. that kind of stuff sticks with you. Um, and then lastly, actually one of them that I think you actually guys work with them is Zendesk. They mm-hmm. keep things super approachable, that friendly, similar to video where like, Hey, we're just in it with you. We're going to just be right next to you kind of hold your hand and be your friend versus like hire us, give us money. We'll kind of keep you at a distance. They kind of broke down those barriers really, really well. I think it's through effective messaging that was not pretentious. I think just, you know, visually just was very easy on the eyes. Um, And it wasn't overly done. That's another thing that I felt some brands kind of take it too far with dressing things up. And they kind of like hit it a really good um, balance and being very, you know, inviting for what they actually do. And like just being really good customer partners, you know, like get help you do customer service, um, not alienate any one type of person or audience. And yeah, that was really well done. Yeah. Yeah. I think all three of those brands that you mentioned are great brands. And I would agree with you that um, everything they're putting out is just awesome. Besides advertising, or maybe when you are looking for examples of good advertising, where do you find yourself uh, exploring and going down rabbit holes online or elsewhere to find sources of inspiration? I think for me, it's like paying attention to like the small discussions that happen. Sometimes some of the small discussions become really big discussions. I think some of the best ideas you ever have are just taking a road trip with your friend that has no, has no idea what you do day to day. I think that's a really good moment of clarity and perspective. Um, I think it's different from inspiration because I think you need to understand working in a high, highly ambitious or fast paced environment, your brain is like a pinball machine. It's just bouncing around constantly and you can kind of feel unsettled, right? So uh, trying to bring it back to reality is like, okay, we all know that we're here for this purpose. Um, There are real issues that do arise, but I'm actually so biased because I'm in this company or in this industry. And to actually talk to someone and like, just say what's on your mind about the the issues that you had in hand. And if it's someone that really doesn't understand what you do, like they'll straight up ask you those very blunt blunt questions. They're like, I actually don't understand anything you're saying. Like you got to break it down, explain like I'm five. And I love those moments because um, some of my closest friends are so far removed from my world um, that when they ask me these blunt questions and like really make me like jog my memories, like, yeah, I got to get out of the habit of talking like, the smartest person in the room. You got to talk, like, bring your back self back down. There's a sense of humility that comes with it. Um, and being like, yeah, sometimes people need to be taken back to where they were like five, 10 years ago. I wasn't in this industry. What did that feel like? And how do I approach that with new lenses um, and try new things? So I'm not really good at writing things out. I think clearly I'm a more visual person. Um, I like things with sound and motion as well. But at the bare bones, can this concept or your mission stand on its own two feet just by written words? And it's been a really good exercise for me. I think I need to be able to write these things out effectively versus just being like, oh, yeah, it's in my head. I know. And I'll, I'll describe it somehow. <laughs> um, we got to like abandon those, you know, safety nets. So um, hopefully I answered that question. Sorry, I kind of like digress there. No. But um, yeah, that was great. No, I, I love the way you're thinking about it. And um, I, I'm a big fan of like going for a walk. Like just going for a walk to clear your head and see what, you know, ideas kind of pop up. So um, I think uh, we look at things fairly similarly there. Um, Now, 
as a VP of brand, obviously you have a lot of big responsibilities. You're, you're responsible mm-hmm. for the brand. What are some things that you still really enjoy getting into the weeds on? Yeah. So I love being equal parts, right and left brain. And I really love getting into the weeds about looking at something like the website, um, the user data. So it's not just about looking at a chart that, you know, you pull and I, so it's like, Oh, X amount of clicks. No, I love the software that we use that tracks heat maps, clicks, um, scroll maps. So I can actually like see recordings. It's all anonymous, obviously, but I can actually see like where people are getting hung up. How many times people are rage clicking on something that they think is going to do something <laughs> that isn't doing something. There's, it's a technical term. It's called rage click. It's for that and hoodie so that, really, that you released. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, that is what I love looking at. And like I devote so much time into because again, I really think you can't, as a designer, be like, hey, this looks good. This is trendy. We should do this. It's absolutely not what you should do. You should look at what people are at, how they're actually using your project service. Um, in this use case, it's a website and getting down into like, are they even scrolling at this? Are they even clicking this? Are they seeing it? Are they passing go? Do they not even care? And so as we iterate, we just went through a whole refresh not too long ago. All that data for two years, when upon the first release, we collected and really aggregated to look at like, hey, we're going to make some design changes, but those are real changes based on user behavior. And that's so exactly what VDF's here to do for the you know advertising industry. They're making effective changes based on real life behavior. Um, they have like a lot more screens, a lot more you know responsibilities in terms of using the platform and it gets really nitty gritty in there. But in my world, even like using the app or the website where I can just look at individual use cases and removing a page, adding a page, removing content, creating more video content because they're so, you know, doing so well, all those kind of informed decisions. Um, that's just stuff I like to look in and maybe people consider in the weeds um, that maybe someone else can do, but I personally just really love doing it. I think it sets you up as a leader to be better, to show like, Hey, I don't just sit here and dictate what to do. Like, I'm also at the very you know lowest level of being like, all right, let's start from scratch. Critique me, see if my assumptions were wrong, prove my thesis, you know, wrong, prove me. And then we go from there. And I really do think you got to set that example from whatever position you have. Yeah, that's so cool. Again, I can tell that you actually enjoy this work. So it's just so cool. Um, so what are maybe as sort of a flip side to that, what are some of the maybe more or rather less glamorous parts of what you get to do? Some of the things you you do that, you know, when people think about building brands, they think, oh, that's got to be so fun. But not everything is always fun all the time. So what are the things that I don't want to say tedious, Absolutely. but yeah, less glamorous yeah, maybe not tedious, but definitely less glamorous is, look, from early on, I mean, I went to our school as undergrad, you got to grow thick skin real fast. Mm-hmm. Um, your, your beautiful painting, someone can hate it and they'll tell it to your face. I mean, that's just part of critiquing and, you know, art and design is so personal. Uh, I would say from like when I was a lot younger, you get, you were a lot more attached. You were very like, no, but I spent all my energy into this you don't get it, you're clearly not smart enough um, or you just don't get it. Right. But no, that's such a bad way to think. And like, thankfully I've come on the other end of that. I'd be like, I love presenting things and like opening up for discussion. And so maybe like the less glamorous thing is being like, Hey, hit me with your hardest feedback. Show me why it doesn't work. And then something that's very visual. I mean, just think about you and I, your favorite color could be orange. I'm like, I can't even look at orange. It's just a, it's just an innate thing we have, regardless of like our position or background. And so when you do something that's so visually charged, um, it's a little bit hard to receive feedback from people that can be extremely blunt without consideration that, hey, sometimes, you know, I do look at user data and I made a decision based on something, but you're coming at me like I did this out of my own admission. Uh, so having those kind of like difficult conversations can be something that's a lot less glamorous, but I think it's also very necessary. Um, I think also, you know, looking at, what's less glamorous is like trying to be different and not just saying it, you know, it's, I don't want to say it's not glamorous, but it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. I think in a lot of industries, trends are going to exist, right? Time and time again, we're just, we look at things, things get popular, things go viral. It's impossible not to look at trends, but what's not glamorous is to get pigeonholed. You don't want to only be known by something like that. So like the innovation that comes in uh, creatively, we all get writer's block, um, creator's block. And so sometimes you got to like learn how to remove yourself and get, you can be really hard on yourself. I know I can, where I'm like, I just cannot get out of this rut and no one can help me, you know? 
So having those moments of like, they're kind of dark moments there where, you know, as a leader, you never want to show weakness, but really abandoning that and being like, Hey, just like you, I'm human. I'm having a really hard time today. I'm not going to be the best here. Um, can you take the reins or can you like, you know, show me new perspective or call me out? You know, I think those are not, you know, quote unquote glamorous, but I think that's, again, going back to Vidiamp's brand and culture is like the human side of things. Um, don't forget that. Don't be so high up on like your position or like what you're hired for. Abandon that. Leave that at the door sometimes, you know, when you're not doing well, you're not doing well. Hmm. I'm just being able to speak about that. That's great. Yeah, I love that. It's it's really cool too as we've worked together mm-hmm. that you have the design background because a lot of like, you know, VPs, maybe they come from more like the business side or whatever. So sure. every time we design, every time we design something or deliver something, it's so nice just even if you don't like it, you're like, Hey, I see the intentionality behind this and I see why you did this, but let's try to do something else or like, let's tweak it. So th- that's why it's, you're just, you're so awesome to work with. Cause I think you balance that perspective really nicely where it's like, okay, yeah, this looks good, but it's not going to get the job done. So like, let's, let's take a look at the user data. Let's take a, take a look at what our clients are actually like looking for and tweak it appropriately. So I think that's like, such oh, no, a, I really, I super appreciate that. <laughs> it's such a hard balance to strike. And I think just speaking for myself, I'll skew the the other way too, where I'm maybe just not as a, you know, more, as a visual person I'm getting there, but I'm always just like, just show me what the data says. And well, I don't really, I don't really care mm-hmm. what it looks like. Cause it's not for me. It's so like, just show mm-hmm. me if it's working or not. Um, but I, I don't think that that, I think that's kind of dismissive in, in some ways too. Um, but yeah, I'm going to switch gears for just two seconds. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's something that I think we're all dealing with right now. But, you know, obviously, like the macroeconomic climate is changing. What does that mean for brand people? What does that mean for marketers right now? Yeah, I mean, uncertainty or, you know, very volatile climates. It really makes people uneasy. Um, but again, what I think it's going to really test is how vigilant you can be, um, mm-hmm. how agile you can be. And how quickly you can pivot. I think adjusting, we've learned this through COVID to some degree, but coming back out of it and kind of feeling settled again and then getting thrown back into Mm -hmm. changing climates. Um, Some people are very uneasy right now. And so I think for brand marketers or designers, I think people, you got to like be really willing to hear people out and like listen to what they really need versus saying like, oh, well, things are so chaotic and let's just do what we're good at. So we're not like shaking the boat too much. No, let's like kind of like open our ears a little wider. Um, think about the discussions and listen, like really listen to what they really want or what people are concerned about. And, you know, first impression for me is like when there's uncertainty or like things are changing, people start to retreat, right? They kind of want a sense of security or sure. um, they kind of want leadership, right? But again, I also think they want a moment of joy. People are getting bar- bombarded with bad news or Things are going up and down and people don't know what to do and there's a confusion. It's not so different. Like our industry is always so complicated and things move so so quickly. It's kind of best prepared me and my team where we're like opening our ears a little bit wider right now. We're being a little bit more hyper vigilant, if you will, so that we're not just only reacting. We're like being proactive. I mean, I just had these amazing sessions with my team the past two weeks where we're like, Hey, let's just open the door. I want to know what everyone is doing. I have people from, you know, Billy, who's a video, you know, God, he's just so creative in the video world. I'm like, Show me what you got. Show me what you're thinking of. Cause like, I know what I like and I know what the work that you do is amazing, but like, what's really making you tick, right? Is there anything from there that's going to drive the needle for us creatively that we can test out in this time? Mm-hmm. That's going to create a sense of security. That's going to bring a moment of joy. That's going to show the people that like, Hey, they're not just like, you know, resting on their loyal laurels and just doing what they know how to do best. That they are again, staying true to their brand, being their risk takers. They might be the game changers. They might be doing the one, be the ones to do things differently. Like not just saying that they are, they really are doing it. And again, investing in your people, once again, like giving people time to feel uneasy. And mm. like, I think personally for me, I do my best work when there's a little bit of stress. You know, I'm not saying I'm, I want all the stress, but a little <laughs> bit of stress goes yeah. a long way. And so right now the world is going through a little bit of stress and people are going to thrive. I do believe that positivity comes out of this. Um, it's not for everybody. Some people are going to flounder and feel really insecure, but with good leadership, with good guidance, and again, with partnership, like the whole, f- I'm with you as a friend versus like a client, mm-hmm. that's what's going to make you win. It's going to be the one that thing that, you know, really shifts the needle um, and then form like lifelong bonds, right? Not just in a business sense, but from like a person to person sense. I think that's, um, 
something to really hone on, hone in on is like, just remember, like we're all in the same exact society. We're dealing with the same things, but you can choose to, you know, flounder and whine about it. Or you can be like, Hey, no one really knows. There's no playbook for this, but we're going to try to pitch ideas. And if you want to come on for the ride and go with us, we're here for it. I love that. We have, it's like kind of a similar perspective and I don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, but like how we've been thinking about it too is yeah, sure. There's like, you know, some like the economic climate is different, but Mm -hmm. it's also poses an opportunity to like, Hey, maybe we're a little bit more aggressive here and maybe we like push some of the chips back into the middle a little bit and see Mm -hmm. if, like you said, like taking a risk, but maybe it's a more calculated risk, but it's, it's, it's almost like the, the stupid diamond analogy, right? Like it's got to get, got to go through some pressure to get it Mm -hmm. to the place that you want it to be. Um, so I think we have like a similar perspective on that too, but it's, sometimes it's hard to practice what you preach when you're, when you're looking at the realities of things as well. Um, what do you think? So I feel, you know, what, whatever the economic climate ends up being over the next, you know, four five, six months, whatever it is, what do you think companies will do like less of or more of as it relates to kind of where we're standing right now on the, the global economic climate? Yeah, I think as a whole, I know it's like a very general statement, but you know, what I would hope to see, and I do think will happen to some degree is people are going to experiment more. Um, mm. And I think that's even from just personnel. I think when things are so uncertain and things are changing so much, people are opening up their doors to like hire people that may have not been the people they hired like five, 10 years ago. They're like, you know what? This is the time to open your door, bring in some new talent from like different backgrounds that may interject and, in, you know, some knowledge that we never thought about. Uncover these new truths, um, these new tactics, new channels of communication. I think that's going to be pretty key um, because if you sit back when things are like really just shaky and you're just like waiting for things to ride out, like I said earlier, you're just going to miss the boat. You're, things are just right. moving too much. Think about also in like this landscape of media consumption. I mean, I don't have social media and I still feel like I'm exhausted from like intake of like what I'm seeing every day. And so just like the younger generation coming up or the companies that are catering to that younger generation coming up and into the workforce and these companies that are going to hire these people, they have a very different approach and stamina for how they consume the world information and also put it back out. Their way of communication is very different from my way of communication Um, I would say attention span is very different Um, and also just channels. They have so many different avenues right now, like between apps and just streaming services, Um, the way they learn how to be educated through video. I mean, we didn't have that. That was like not even an option or a thought back then. And so um, I think companies will invest in new talent, um, which will allow them to experiment a bit more. Um, And that also means adopting new technologies. I think that if you don't want to be the kid that's left behind, you have to like be a little bit more flexible with the the spend, right? So like you have to like test things out and something like with video app is like, we really do want you to test things out to prove why it doesn't work versus based on assumption or being too scared to take that risk. Cause you know, it's a little, you you don't want to be embarrassed. Um, We got to kind of abandon all that to really succeed is like, you never really get somewhere by being comfortable all that innovation comes from being very uncomfortable and being really put under the fire, under the gun. And like, you know, what comes at is you could be the first, you could be the one Mm. that really does pivot. And there's leadership that comes out of that and confidence. And so that confidence put back into your workforce is so infectious. And I think that if we do tap in and experiment, allow people to breathe a little bit more and not just be hired for like just what they're good at, um, they're going to give back a lot more. So hopefully, yeah, experimenta- ex- experimentation is something that I really look forward to. Um, I'm so sorry. Did you ask like a second part of that question? No, that was perfect. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, one of the things that we've chatted with a lot of people about is this idea of reprioritizing and focusing on the things mm-hmm. that are known to get results. What's what's sort of a sleeper tactic Um or something that you think is just wildly underrated when it comes to performance that maybe isn't top of mind for most people? I would say a lot of companies talk a big game about culture. Mm. Very few execute upon it. And so investing heavily on culture is underrated. Um, And that also involves not just a shiny, like, 
things you advertise, what the company gives you. I'm talking about the candid, haven't seen it, behind the scenes <laughs> moments that really create culture. Culture is not created by saying like, oh, I have this vision for what the office life you know looks like. That is not culture. You know what is culture is like those random ass moments that you have with your coworkers um, behind closed doors on a late Friday night because you're just like so close to like uncracking something, solving something. Or I'm telling you, the friends that you hang out with from work that you know become like lifelong friends with, and those conversations that you have, it's those candid moments, and you shine a light. I'm just so surprised that a lot of companies don't invest more on that and telling that story. Um, I think it's not just a photo collage of like team bonding events. I think it's showing the mess ups. I think it's literally showing the blooper reels and being like very okay with that and being like, hey, no company is perfect not a single one. And so like anytime you only see the finesse product or like the platform that's won awards or like all the big names that follow you, that's not it. That is not mm. what makes you win. Your story is built upon the people that are driving the platforms, the solutions that are speaking on the company's behalf. And there's so much more behind the shiny finished product, right? So I think that, you know, it is underrated. I think culture is just seen as maybe like perks and benefits and like you just kind of like yep. put that on a job rack, you know, and call it a day. But, you know, what, you know, I love about video app is like they double down on the culture here. I mean, TK knows like he's been at the office. He's kind of been permeated mm -hmm. into it. He knows that we live and breathe it in the physical form, um, not just professionally, but socially outside of work. And I think it's just something that you can't put a price on. So, yeah, mm -hmm. invest in your culture, invest in your people, show the behind the scenes camera moments, show that they're real people. Everyone fails, you know, gets you know, gets, gets back up. Yeah. The yeah. cool thing about video app too is there's what leadership says the culture is and then it's what you know your employees actually feel and and how they interact with it and there's so many times that we'll see we ask about culture and they you know like oh this is what it is we talk about valuing our employees and we talk about valuing our clients or whatever the you know the talk track is but then you see the actions that are put into place it's like well that's feels like that's counter to what you're saying the culture is. So that's not really what your culture is. You're just trying to check that box. Whereas, yeah, I think video amp does an amazing job. We really try to pride ourselves on our culture too. And so like it's permeated through all of our OKRs, through all of our like KPIs, how we measure stuff, both, both qualitatively and quantitatively. It's like, Hey, how is this measuring up to what we said we wanted this company to be? Is that, are we on the right track? And I think you guys do an amazing job at that too. Um, but I think that's a, a very, uh, that should be its own podcast of just talking about company culture, but it's, hu it's huge. I think it's something that is really front of mind for us too. I mean, right back at you. I, you, you know how I feel about the C5 team. I think you guys really do live. I think your mantra really is do good work with good people, right? It's yeah, along those yeah, lines. Yeah. I mean, you guys are my absolute favorite. You guys know how much I love you guys. I'm going to adopt you guys. You guys are part of the family forever. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I joke about it, but Thursdays are my best days because I get to see you guys. Oh, yeah. Wow. Put on the testimonial. That's, uh, <laughs> thank you so much. That's a huge, huge compliment coming from you. Yeah, I really um, mean it. That's so cool. It's so funny hearing you guys talk about culture because it takes me back like 10 years where I was thinking at the time, like having a ping pong table and yeah. <laughs> eight beers no, that is on not Fridays with culture, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we've come a long way and it sounds like you guys well, are you know what? Bar, which is so cool. Now it's uh, probably going to be like, uh, do you even culture if you don't have a pickleball court? So yep, pickleball. I mean, the thing <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, I just, I just, I just got the pickleball bug, and uh, oh, I knew you would get into it. I knew it. Yeah. Yeah. I knew it. <laughs> uh, okay, we gotta. We're about to wrap up here. Um, For sure. But be before we break, it's 2023, so I have to ask you. What kind of Web3 or crypto, et cetera, play might make sense for you all in the in the near or medium term? You know, I don't feel super confident ask, answering that question. I think we should keep that one for another day. But, you know, a lot of new things are on the, on the horizon. And I know this is such a hot topic for a lot of people. Um, but, yeah, stay tuned. Okay. Yeah, well, I can appreciate that. And... Um, well, Michelle, thank you so much for being on. It's been just a pleasure uh, spending some time with you and you know having this interview with you. If people want to find out more like information bikes. about you and uh, want to follow you on social, how could they find you? Actually, before you answer that, let me just start that over because 
that dump truck yeah, was incredibly loud. Trash, Did you guys hear that? <laughs> yeah. How, oh, yeah. It's, it's, how like, rude. <laughs> it's like he's <laughs> waiting, he's waiting for me to be <laughs> off mute and he's like, I'm going to go do another loop there. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, well, Michelle, it's been so great having you on. Uh, it's been a joy just talking with you and uh, hearing from you. If people want to find out more about you and if they want to follow you, where, where should they find you? LinkedIn, socials, where? Yeah. Well, first off, thank you guys. I mean, for spending this uh, Thursday lunch hour with me, it has been an absolute pleasure and really honored for you to ask me these awesome questions. Uh, unlike TK, I am not on social media, so you cannot find me on social media. <laughs> I have, okay. I think it's like past my generation. So not to date myself, but I've never really got that social media book, but I'm on LinkedIn. Um, also you can just email me directly. MK at video amp. I'm super, you can reach me out at any time. I love talking to people, answering questions and people have reached out in the past via email. So I know that sounds really, really old of me, but that's probably my preferred method. Awesome. Well, thank you, you so much. Your fax yeah. number? You don't want to throw your fax number in there? Do you want to oh, yeah. My pager, my pager number <laughs> is... Can you have my pager real quick? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Column 5's Best Story Wins is for marketing and branding professionals looking to unlock their growth potential. Each episode features a conversation with industry leaders about how they win the hearts and minds of their customers and build world-class brands. You'll learn about their success stories and their failures, as well as ideas for how to take your own marketing efforts to the next level. Welcome to Best Story Wins.